Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me not uh, delay the start of the program any further. Uh, so we'll start today with our first speaker, Sean Majid, <coughs> and he's going to talk about the WAC operators built from quantum remote and Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. So um, I'm actually not really coming from operator algebras, but I will intersect with Alan Kant spectral triples uh, in the second half. But uh, and uh, uh, mainly because um, I won't use much operator algebras because my examples would be, would be finite dimensional. But the, but the mathematics that I'm talking about, especially if you want to apply it to plane scale yeah. physics, should involve a lot of operator algebra. So there's a lot of scope in the future. So where I'm coming from is the quantum space-time hypothesis, and this says that space-time coordinates x, y, z, t are better modeled as a non-linear geometry than as a classical one. Um, so uh, due to quantum gravity effect. So quantum gravity, whatever it is, uh, but it should induce some first-order corrections to, to classical geometry, which we call quantum. Riemannian geometry. And you can semi classicalize that, you get something called Poisson Riemannian geometry. And the deformation parameter here is the Planck scale, it's not h bar. Um, and then in the limit, you get your relativity. So the question is what goes here? And of course, there are lots of ideas for this. Um, and Alan Kahn has his ideas from using a Dirac operator to replace the notion of a manifold. Um, the approach I will talk about, which I hope to convince you, um, uh, that it's interesting is it's based on it's much more explicit than what Alan does. It actually builds the metric tensor directly into the formalism and the Lebedev interconnection, uh, etc. And that approach is in this textbook. So if anyone's interested, there's an 800-page textbook you can read about. It. <coughs> so now the nice thing about this quantum Riemannian geometry is that a special case of it is just discrete geometry. So the reason why graphs have such a nice geometrical flavor, you can do Laplacians on graphs, is because they're just examples of quantum Riemannian geometry. Um, and so then once you, so, so to even looking at graphs or other finite dimensional algebras, you can then, so replacing space-time coordinates by a finite dimensional algebra, for example, functions on a finite graph, um, you can then actually do quantum gravity if you want. So there are there are so quantum gravity has been solved in a universe of four points. So um, the other application of of finite quantum Riemannian geometry um, is Alan Kahn's idea that if you take space time and you tensor product space time by a finite dimensional um, spectral triple. Then, then that would that then then the geometry on that tensor product space time would encode multiplets of fields on classical space time when viewed on classical space time, and those multiplets and then kind of arranges it so that you actually reproduce the standard model or the Zulu particle from the standard model. So um, the, the trouble with Anna, what, what what Anna has been criticised for is that the framework is too general. Almost anything it's a spectral triple when when you're working with matrices. So. It doesn't, so basically you can feed in the data and get back the model you wanted. But what you really want is more, is more geometrical constraints, which will tell you, focus on a particular spectral triple, and then you can compare that with the real world, so you get predictive power. So that's what quantum Riemannian geometry does, because I will show you that not every, in its formalism, not every spectral triple is obtained geometrically from a spin connection and a Clifford algebra. So the question is, uh, yeah, so that's what we call the geometric realization. So that's what I want to show you today. So I'll first explain the QRG formalism. I'll show you the example of the Dinkin graph for, for AM. That's just, that's just a line, a finite interval chain. Um, and, uh, and then I'll show you a general construction which constructs Dirac operators, spectral triples from QRGs. Okay, so first one. Okay, so uh, I think I, um, I'm not sure if anybody needs this, but just in case. Uh, <coughs> On a classical manifold, you've got the exterior algebra of differential forms. And we're going to, where of course A, the algebra is the infinity of them. We're going to replace that, obviously, by a non-commutative algebra. So we'll drop any kind of uh, commutativity, but we'll keep associativity. So the first order, that means that the space of one form is some bimodule over, over A. So A is now potentially a non-commutative, it'll be a star algebra, you eventually complete it to a C star algebra if you want. Um, but A should be, um, yeah, omega 1 should be an A by module. That means, uh, and it should be a map D from A into omega 1. So a by module means if you have a differential here, you multiply it from C by, by A or C, you get the same as the other way around, that's associativity. And D should obey the Leibniz rule using the by module structure. 
And of course, omega-1 should be spanned by things like this. So these are the axioms of the first order differential calculus. Now, if you're starting with a spectral triple, uh, then you can you can recover a kind of calculus um, from from it. But in our approach, this is the starting point. So we're going to build up geometry layer by layer, starting with the differential calculus, then the metric case, etc. Now, of course, that's just one form. Usually, the, um, you can take a kind of product of one form and generate a differential graded algebra for all the higher forms. We don't need that too much. Uh, then we're going to do some metric. So a metric is an element of omega 1 tends to omega 1. Okay, so if you're a physicist, it's a G mu nu, it has two indices. But, though, but, it, but it's also located at one point in space. It's not G mu nu of x comma y, it's at one point. So that, that being at one point is the, is the, the tensor, is the tensor product over the algebra. Okay, so that's mathematically where a metric tensor lives. And we should have an inverse, this is G upper mu nu, if you're a physicist. So this would be, if you evaluate this on dx mu dx nu, you'll get an upper tensor, G mu nu. And so this should be a bimodule, um, this should be inverse to this in the following sense. It's a mix omega one, a rigid object in the category of a bimodules. So that means if you apply the, if you take the omega and you contract it using the metric with one leg of the metric, you get back omega. Similarly on the other side, reading these diagrams down the page. This literally, if you had a basis for omega one over a, then this literally says that the matrix for this is inverse to the matrix for x. But, you don't, it could, but typically, omega 1 will be a projective one. Okay. Now, a connection. This was used, uh, so a left connection. Uh, normally, you think of a connection as a covariant derivative. Given a vector field, you get a map, let's say, from omega 1 to omega 1. And that's the case here, because if I have a vector field, I can evaluate it against this omega 1. Uh, uh, and then I will get just a map from omega 1 to omega 1. And this property here in the classical case would ensure that nabla x, if you evaluate it against x, would be a derivation. But we keep this algebraic form. It's a bit like a coaction if you know about quantum groups. And now this expresses the left Leibniz rule. And this is a standard left connection goes back to Quillen and people in the 70s. Um, but what's uh, more new for us, uh, which was introduced by Peter Michor and Michel dupont violet is the notion is well the thing is that omega one is a right is a bimodule, so it should also be a right-handed Leibniz rule. So if I if I multiply from the right, I should get firstly I should come out, and then I should get omega tensor df. The thing is, is that if I evaluate against a vector field, it will be on the far left. So the df has to be carried through to the far left somehow. So you need some kind of bimodule map, which classically would be the flip map. So so now this sigma is determined by, by nabla, so it's not additional data, it's just that some connections admit sigmas and some don't. So we're going to, yes? Yeah. I have a question about your Riemannian matrix. This G is not assumed to be central, is it? Well, as it happens, it isn't central by assumption, but it turns out that, the very comment, it turns out that by the time you impose a bimodule inverse, it turns out that G is in the center. Oh, okay. It's not something we put in. Okay. And, um, yeah. and, and of course, that doesn't matter in the classical limit, but it means that quantum Riemannian geometries are more restrictive if the algebras will have a big center. Um, then uh, we'll see some examples. Um, there are ways to get around that if you, if you, if you, if you want something more flabby. Now, um, yeah, so you need this bimodule map. So this is determined by this data. So we say a connection is a bimodule connection if it admits a sigma, and if it does, the sigma is unique. Now, the thing about the category of bimodule connections is it's a monoidal category, so you can tend to product bimodule connections. So, for example, I've got a connection nabla on omega 1, <coughs> I've got, then I get a tensor product connection on omega 1 tensor omega 1 on this guy. So, if I've got an element omega in omega 1 and another element eta, this is the tensor product, then the way I act with nabla is I apply nabla in the first one, I apply nabla on the second one, and then I use sigma to put the left output of nabla in the right place. You can see it more clearly with a diagram reading down the page. So we're going to apply it to the metric. The metric is the element of omega one tensor omega one. And I apply nabla to the first leg of the metric. Then I apply nabla to the second leg of the metric. And then this leg here, which is where a vector field would evaluate, has to be moved to the far left to be consistent with this, with this term. And so you, this is where, the, where sigma comes in. We write it like a braiding. So that's our notation. Uh, well, I won't use this diagrammatic notation very well. I just find it clearer to show what's going on. Um, so, so therefore, with a bimodule connection, we know automatically what is metric compatibility. It's just that nabla g is zero. So that, that's the beauty of working with bimodule connections. Um, 
Now, the other question we need for a Lebedev detection is torsion. Now, torsion geometrically is just the two comparison of the two ways to go from omega 1 to omega 2. You can go by the serial derivative d, or you can go by a nabla, which takes you into omega 1 tensor omega 1, and then you can use the wedge product to project back to omega 2. So that so those two different routes, they the difference is the torsion. And so, so we want torsion to be zero. So now um, then you can define a quartz curvature. This is the same as for any left connection that's been known since the 70s. You just apply, it's basically nebula square, but with a correction to make it into a left um, you can prove things like the Bianchi identity, which is nice. The, the, the wedge product of the output. Now, so, so now our nebula is a map from omega 1 into two form valued. Uh, it's a two form valued operator on omega 1. The, of course, this out language is very algebraic and it's very unfamiliar. If, if you have grown up with the modern geometry, then you're used to these equations written with lots of tensors and lots of indices. But I actually find the algebraic picture, like this, much cleaner. And much easier to work with than working with lots of tensors. And of course, it works when the algebra is not okay. So um, uh, that's the region where Raman curvature is, fairly, is, uh, is completely standard. Now, Ricci curvature is a bit more mysterious. And I will be honest, we have a, in the book, we have a working definition, which is this one, but it's just copied from physicists. It's not, it doesn't have a deeper understanding. And uh, I would love to have a deeper point of view, which would, uh, you know, but anyway, it's a working definition, it's enough to work with models, and it works quite nicely. So we take the Riemann tensor. This output is an omega 2 tensor omega 1. Omega 2, if you think it has two indices, but it doesn't, it's an element of omega 2. You have to lift it into omega 1 tensor omega 1, then it has two indices. So you need a bimodule map from omega 2 into omega 1 tensor omega 1. Classically, it would be the map which sends a two form into an anti-symmetric pair of one forms. Um, but, uh, but in modern geometry, because we don't know what the structure of the differential graded algebra is, we have to specify as additional data. So the Riemann Ricci tensor depends on that. Once you've done the lifting, you can now take a trace, which I've done using the metric. So that would be contracting indices, the way it moves. So that's the working definition. It's not live in the right place, at least. Then you can define the Ricci scalar to be the contraction of Ricci. You find the method through omega 1. Um, and that's the Ricci scalar. So that, now there's also a very natural the plus Beltrami operator, which is just d delta. Delta is the one point into the scalar into an element of A. It's just to apply nabla, and then you're in omega 1 tensor omega 1, and then you apply the, the metric, so that then you're in A. So this bit here is, is delta. Quite canonically from the data I've given you so far from the method. And therefore, this is the natural the classical triangle. Now, if you are interested in operator, operator algebras, you have to have a star structure. So we'll take it, we'll do what I end up in fact, with most of the time works with a, a star sub algebra, which is dense in the thing he's interested in. So we'll work with a star algebra. And this will extend to, the, we'll assume this extends to the, to the differential graded algebra as, as a skew, as a graded. Um, anti uh, evolution. Like this. And, and in a way that D commutes with star. So that, that's all consistent. Um, it's actually what I land up in this book somewhere. Um, now the metric should be then be real. And the natural condition, if you think, if you think pretty hard about it, you'll see that on omega 1 tensor omega 1 tensor product over A, there is a well defined operator which I call dagger. And it's to apply star in both places of omega one, and then flip, and that is consistent with the, with being a tensor product over A. And so we just require G to be invariant under that. And in, if you had a basis, if you were in the classical limit with a basis d x mu, then this would be telling you that the G mu new tensor is is real. Um, the then the uh, similarly for the connection, we wanted to be star preserving. This says that it basically commutes with so star before and dagger afterwards, but with it, with with the flip coming in as well, with, with the generalized gradient coming in. And again, in the classical limit, this will tell you that the Christoffel symbols are real. So this is all very natural. The other thing which we all need for a Hilbert space is we'll need some kind of integration. So we'll have a positive linear functional, typically it'll be a trace on the algebra. And this is what everybody does anyway. Um, we'll use that to define the, the inner product, that's in the Okay, so now all of this is enough already 
to do quantum gravity on, on, on any star algebra for which you can compute everything. So uh, this is this is um, of course you would like this is just a roadmap. I'm not going to do all of this today. Um, so the first thing you to do, for baby quantum gravity, I mean that the algebra A is finite dimensional. I'll put an F here to remind you. So if A is A finite dimensional, you don't have to worry too much. For most of it, you don't have to worry about um, uh, anything analysis. Um, so choose your finite dimensional algebra. Choose your exterior algebra. There isn't a unique one. I mean, there is a universal one for any algebra, but it's way too big. It's not at all like the classical. Doesn't have the right classical limit. So you choose one which has a, a good a good limit. Um, usually there'll be some parameter in the algebra. Uh, then you choose, then you compute the moduli of metrics, which is aided by the fact that the metric is central. Um, then you compute the moduli of quantum levity beta connections. Now, classically, levity beta is unique, but that's not the case here. We'll have a moduli of them. Um, then for each connection and each metric, you'll compute the Ricci scalar, the way I've shown you. And then you'll integrate it. That will give you the Einstein Hilbert action. And so now you've got everything you need for quantum gravity. The position function here will be an integral over, on the, over the moduli of pairs, which is the metric and levity beta connection, with uh, e to the i over g, g is the topic constant, integral of s. So that all makes complete sense now for any, any star algebra. Uh, well, at least, any, at least one where these integrals make sense. Now, these moduli are to be, uh, because everything is finite, these moduli will be finite dimensional. So this integral, instead of being some ridiculous functional integral, it will be just an ordinary integral over a applied manifold or something like that. Now these integrals will still diverge, but they won't diverge in a crazy way. They'll diverge in a very controllable way so that you can, you can actually compute things. Now this has all been done for a few examples here. For Z2 cross Z2 within my original paper here, for Z2 is with, my, uh, with, with one of my students, Julio uh, of Dr. Kiros. They were solved for the fuzzy sphere with my student, Evelyn. And um, so the, some common features are, firstly, that when you compute the expectation value of Jimmy you knew, okay, I'm not sure that I to explain that. This is just the ratio of this expression with Jimmy you knew in there divided by the same by, by z. So it's the, it's the, this is like the, the partition functions, but from that you can do the expectation value of any operators. So this will typically have a log divergence, but the ratio uh, things like this is the variance, the, the, the expectation value of g mu nu squared minus the expectation value of g mu nu squared, uh, square rooted, that's the standard deviation, uh, divided by the average value. These things have to be well defined and uniform. So there is a kind of uniform, typically a uniform, non zero metric fluctuation. It's a kind of vacuum energy. Um, so that's one of the effects that we've discovered so far. But there's a lot more to be studied. I would say that the physics of these quantum gravity models hasn't really been explored as much as it should do. Um, you can also fix G mu nu and just, uh, and just look at um, uh, fluctuations relative to it. So we look at, we look at G mu nu relative to a background one. Now, it hasn't been solved, for example, for two by two matrices. And that's because the moduli is quite large. It's a seven dimensional. There's a, well, basically, any two by two, two invertible matrix will give you a metric, but then there's a four dimensional parameter of QLCs, or quantum levity beta connections. So there's seven dimensional moduli space, uh, which is quite hard to integrate over. But it's, it's doable. Okay. Now, uh, going back to the topic in hand, I want to show you some baby models on graphs. So if you have a finite set, um, it's been known for a long time. Someone told me it's varied in constant, but I could never find it. Uh, that if you have a, a finite set, then first order differential calculi, omega 1, are in one to one correspondence with graphs whose vertices are x. So a graph is nothing other than a differential calculus on a finite, on a discrete, on a discrete set. And omega 1 is just spanned by the arrows. I put omega to just to avoid confusion, but it's just spanned, labeled by the arrows. And the bimodule structure is you multiply from the, you act from the left by evaluating the function on the source of the arrow. And you multiply it on the right by evaluating the function on the target of the arrow. So the bilocal nature of an arrow, right, x is not equal to y. So that means these two products never never equal. So this, although the algebra function is commutative, omega 1 as a bimodule is not commutative. It never can be. It's an intrinsically bilocal concept. That's why you need non commutative geometry. Um, DF is the differential, uh, and it's just a finite difference across all the arrows, summed over all the arrows. 
So this just encodes all possible finite references. And the star structure is, is like this. Now, uh, the path algebra is just to take tensor, it's the tensor algebra over A. So it's just a concatenation of paths. So in degree i, it's just i steps along the graph. It's labeled by i steps along the graph. And omega i x comma y will just be keeping the alpha two fixed and then having i, I steps. Now, um, there's, there's a couple of, there are many choices. Given any omega one, there's always a maximal prolongation. This is for any algebra. Uh, maximal prolongation, it's much smaller than the universal, but it's calculus, but it's still usually too big. So that's omega max. And that on a graph comes out to be imposing these relations. So whenever you have uh, more than, whenever you have fixed P and Q, and you impose this uh, for any Y in between, you, you, add, you impose that their, their wedge is zero when you sum over all such y. And this is for P and Q, which are obeying um, some restrictions. So for omega max, you impose that P and Q is not equal to Q, and P doesn't have an arrow to Q. And that's the most restrictive case, so that's the biggest calculus. Then there's one where you just impose this one. Then there's the one where you just impose the other one. And there's the one where you, do, where you impose it for all P and Q. But that's the strongest one. It gives you the smallest calculus. So we'll call this omega min, and that's actually the one that had the good limit in many examples. So we'll work with this one. Now, omega med and omega min, they're, they're inner calculi. What that means is that there is a particular one form, this one, for which commutated with theta gives you d. So d is, is that could never happen classically because commutated with a one form would be zero. But in the quantum world, many differential calculi are inner. They have an element theta for which commutated with theta recovers the derivative, and that's the case here. We're assuming our set, at least our arrow, should be finite in number. Um, the quantum metric is an element of omega, oh, this is meant to be omega, I the notation. Um, but it's, it's element of omega 1 tensor omega 1 with some coefficients. The inverse metric is, uh, is, is given similarly, is zero unless, well, because of the centrality, you have to have x equals y. If you think about this up here, in the tensor product, you'll be forced to having x, the, the, this beginning will be the same as the one here, so that it's central. Similarly over here, these will be zero unless y equals y prime and x equals x prime. Um, and then these coefficients, either this one or its, its inverse, um, they are non-zero real numbers. That obeys the reality <coughs> condition. So a metric is just assigning a non-zero real number to every arrow. Okay, that's what we'd like it to be. Um, now, here's an example. This is going to be the, the an graph. So this is just a graph of an n, a chain of n, of n nodes. And I'm going to call these arrows ai, and the backward arrows ai prime. And then, of course, this, just, this is just the relations of the algebra. That's nothing. These are, the, these are the relations that tell you, these are the bimodule structure that I told you. It's just that everything's very explicit. The relations of omega max and it would be the same as omega min would be to add these relations here. Omega min adds more relations here. Now, if you just add these, these are a very important al algebra representation theory. This is the preprojective algebra of the Dickin type A n. So that's already a very interesting algebra. But we, we so we take that preprojective algebra and we add these further relations to have an exterior algebra. That's the, that's the exterior algebra we work in. If you look at the dimensions, uh, then they just look like this. So there's so one forms and two forms. And this is a projective, uh, these are projective modules, they're not free modules. Um, now, you have to do a lot of analysis now. This is in my paper with uh, a bunch of heroes, which is about to appear in JMP. Um, first thing is, is that there doesn't always exist a Levitch Peter connection, a, Q a QLT on the Levitch Peter connection. Um, it, you, it turns out that if the metric is edge symmetric, so you might you might be naive and you say, well, I should have the same length to go from x to y as go from y to x, right? You would think that it should be associated to the edge, not to the arrow. And if you thought that, you would discover that there weren't any solutions. So it turns out that that, that it, it turns out that you need you forced to have a direction dependent edge length. So if we call the edge, if we call the length h i pointing to the left. Then the lengths going to the right will be some other lengths, which are differ by a scale factor, which I call phi i. And um, so it turns out that these phi i are completely prescribed by, 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 the, by the geometry of, of, of the graph. 
So um, now this just translating what I wrote before. This, this is what the metric looks like on uh, on on the arrows. Okay. I guess you don't really need that except when you want to compute things. Um, anyway, so that's the setup. Now, using Mathematica, the first thing we did was run Mathematica for a very long time and solved everything explicitly for up to eight nodes. And so these are all the possible solutions for the pi i that admit quantum Riemannian geometries. And uh, so you basically, um, well, there are certain patterns of numbers emerge. Um, we stared at this for a very, very long time. Um, and then we realize that if you focus on the ones where the phi are always positive, because after all, you would think that your edge lengths should be positive. So your hi are positive, you should have your phi h actually be positive. Then in this table, there's only a unique, there's the first row of each table is a unique option where all the phi i's are positive. And then if you look more carefully at, the, at those first rows, they actually can be written like this. The phi i's are exactly the q-deformed integers, um, where q is this uh, root of unity. So, just out of solving for the, not, there's no quantum group in the picture, just out of solving for the quantum Riemannian geometry, the existence of a quantum Riemannian geometry, or the QLT, forces the metric, the ratios, to be, to be uh, different from uh, edge symmetric, and they are controlled by this Q deformation. Um, of course, you can take the limit n goes to infinity, and you'll have, on the half line, you'll have a natural Calculate the quantum Riemannian geometry on the half line on the integers, on, on, on the natural numbers of the half line, which will just involve the limit as q goes to 1, so that will just be i plus 1 over i for the ratio. So, what this says is this is a boundary effect. What it says is, is that emanating from it's, it's more clear if you take n to infinity, so then the effect is only occurs as you approach 1. Because these ratios, i plus 1 over i, becomes very, very rapidly becomes 1. So, it becomes, becomes exometric in the bulk of the, of the chain. But as you approach the edge, it becomes two under the metric. So that's a boundary effect coming from the sudden truncation at the end uh, on, on the left there, in the case of, of, the, of the natural numbers. Now, once we've now if you look in more detail at what the quantum Riemannian looks like, you discover that there is a one-parameter uh, family of quantum Lebesgue connections. So there, there's, it's not unique. But there is a unique one up to a modulus one parameter, the kind of phase parameter. Um, Sorry, may I just ask yeah. this phi? Are you solving these for simultaneously solving for existence of a metric and the connection? Yes. Or, yeah. Well, well, we 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 make yes. We, uh, the, uh, it turns out not depend on h i. So if h i are arbitrary, and we're just we're just solving for the ratio. So it, it turns out that in the equations only these ratios enter. So we're solving for the phi, I, and the metric h i is arbitrary. So you can have an arbitrary length on your chain, which is good if you're doing quantum gravity. Uh, but as long as the out the outbound, the right pointing edge is phi i times the times the uh, left pointing edge, then you can then you will have a unique quantum levity beta connection okay. for for that arbitrary otherwise arbitrary metric. Yeah. Um, okay. <coughs> so uh, now um, just how I won't tell you the proofs because I haven't got time, but uh, just to give you a hint, first thing is that on a, because the calculus is inner, the calculus has, I think there's a typo here that's meant to be the other way around. Anyway, the typo has a, the, the, um, the a connection on the inner calculus has a very simple form. It's given by a kind of commutator with, with the braiding plus a bimodule math alpha. But if your graph doesn't have any triangles, which is the case here, then alpha has to be zero. So the, um, so the connection is determined completely by sigma. So you can just solve for sigma. Now, sigma has to be a bimodule map, and so uh, sigma um, yeah, has to have this general structure. This is just from requiring it to be a bimodule map. Because if you remember, a function, when it comes through, it evaluates by f of, at the value of i plus 2 here. Um, but this should also work if you take it through. Um, okay. I, I, well, I, I don't think there's any point. You have to, you have the ends have to, to be a bimodule map. The, begin, the, the source, the beginning and the end of the chain on which sigma acts have to be preserved. So that's what happens here. But in this case, phi i, this phi i goes a i i plus one and then back. There are two ways to do that. You can go, you can, you can go phi i i plus one and then back, or you can go the other way. You can go step backwards and then forward. So there are two ways. And so sigma, the possible, there are two possibilities. 
and uh, we parameterize like this. Now, we're not independent because we have zero torsion. So by the time you impose torsion, you get a condition on these two, and so this is the general form. And then you and then you get you put in the requirement of being able to be connection. You have a lot of you do you do it by induction, solving it first for n and then truncating it for the ans. For the answer uh, for these coefficients, they're, they're even in terms of Hochheimer functions in terms of s, quite complicated to write down. But they simplify if s is plus or minus one, and that's the case where the structure constants are real. If you want the Christoffel symbols to be real, which is not a requirement, it's still self-preserving as long as modulus of s is one. But if you, the nicest case is if you want to narrow things down, you can ask for the structure constants to be real, and then you would end up with this unique solution. So plus or minus one. But that's what the levy to the connection looks like on end. This is what on looks like, I told you before. So the moral of this is that um, truncating from the, the integers, so if you do this whole thing for the integers, that's much easier, and there's a unique QLT um, for any, that, that works in the symmetric case, uh, and even can be extended in the asymmetric case. The, so Z works very well without much restrictions. But when you trun truncate it to n, you get the direction dependence of the metrics, more toward which is uh, um, okay. emanating from the boundary. Then you get uh, further truncation when you go from n to a n, to when you truncate it on the right hand side. And this turned out to be a Q deformation. And there's a nice mystery for anyone who's uh, interested to, I haven't figured it out yet, what is the role of UQSL2, right? There should be a, Q a role of UQSL1 plus 1 as some kind of diffeomorphism group of, uh, or a geometry group of geometry <laughs> or something, but it's, it's not at all clear. Okay. Uh, I just want to show you a tiny, um, tiny model, then we'll go to the other, other half of the talk. So this is just n equals 3, so the a3 graph, there are three nodes, so phi i is just root 2, uh, phi 1 is root 2, and phi 2 is 1 over root 2, and um, and so that's the metric. Uh, this is what the Christopher symbol looks like. This is plus or minus one. Then it's just a sample. This doesn't mean anything to anyone because it's too much to take in, but just show you, just give you a flavor of what it looks like. Now, to do the Ricci tensor, we've got to give a lifting map. So there is one for general AM, even also for N, which is just to lift this to, the anti to an antisymmetric combination like this. So this is a bimodule map, and it projects down. To, it, it's compatible with the wedge product. It splits the wedge product. That's what we require. I don't think, I'm not sure I mentioned that, but I should split the wedge product, which it does. So, um, so, so that's the that's the canonical choice for lifting map. The scalar curve, which I've just written it for one, it's also similar for minus one. You can work it out. It's three. It's valued at three. It's a function on on three points. So it's got three values, which are these weights times this function that comes out of the front. So that's what the metric, that's what the scalar curvature looks like. Now the Einstein Hilbert action would be to integrate the scalar curvature with some measure. And we'll take the measure to be given through the metric. So you know this is this is where uh, we it's a, there's a bit of guesswork involved as to what is a good measure, but classically you'd have the square root of the determinant of the metric, right? So we don't have we're not going to use that. That's not not likely to work. Um, uh, but we just take, we just do something very simple. We take mu to be h one, mu three to be h two. Luckily, we don't need to know what mu two is because there's a zero here anyway. So we take uh, so then we get this, and it depends only on this ratio h two over h one rho. So now quantum gravity means to integrate over all possible metrics. So integral of d d h one d h two. But it depends only on rho, so we'll change coordinates to h1 and rho. So that's the change of measure. So now it's creating over rho. And then in, that, in those terms, the action looks like this, where c is this number. So that has a very nice form. All these integrals are doable. If you even put a rho to the m in there, you can do these integrals. You just get Bessel, Bessel k functions. So, um, so now you can take, so that, so that, this allows you to compute the expectation value of rho to the m. So the mth power, of these metric ratios, and um, as g goes to uh, well, you've got two different regimes. One is sort of weak gravity, and the other one more interest is strong gravity. But this actually diverges. As I told you, there will be log divergences, but that's not a problem. If you look at ratios, take the standard deviation of rho divided by its average value. 
This is a number which you can compute from the Bessel function, it's a completed formula, but it has a nice limit as you go to infinity, as it goes to one. So that means that there's a fixed standard deviation in large, uh, so that's one of the effects of quantum gravity. And uh, I really would like to explore a lot more in these models, but uh, it's, more, it's more a question of, you've done the theory, what questions do you want to ask? And nobody really knows what to ask. It's like, you know, you want quantum gravity for so long, if someone gives it to you, you don't really know what to do with it. So um, we're at that stage. Of course, you have to you have to believe uh, that this is a useful model. But if you're a non-commutative geometer, then I think everything I've done has been, to my mind, quite canonical. I've just made very minimal assumptions. Um, the only the biggest assumption was the structure of the Rishi cancer. So okay. Now, the second half of this talk. A question yeah. before you yeah. continue. So for these finite sets, you choose this. Uh, calculus, which, and then you relate it to the path algebra of this graph, right? Somehow. Well, we, we only use that, yeah. Yeah. So, is, is there some way to see that the, the algebraic properties of the path algebra related to, I don't know, cohomology or dimensions and so on? Of the yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot you can do that. Um, that's not really the topic today, but you can, uh, on any, on any non-commutative algebra in this framework, you can look at the category of, uh, flat bimodular connections. That form of the modal category. You can use einlandberg maclean theorem to reconstruct a Hopf algebra from that. And that will be to play the role of the algebra, the Hopf algebra of differential, uh, Hopf algebra of differential operators on the manifold. That was about my student Ariane Kobali. And and, um, and then uh, when you look at that, you will see. Um, what was your what's your question again? Well, so like for instance, that, I mean, if you take the path algebra, you can ask about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But now, when you when you take so what Ariane does is he then applies it to the graph case, yeah. and you can recover the known uh, homology theory of graphs based on the path algebra. So there is a known there is a known homology theory of graphs, oh, okay. yeah. and you recover that from this algebra from this algebra, from path algebra with, um, with differential. And the, and the commodity of your differential graded algebra will be related to the oh, oh no uh, no in general okay that's just that's a, no that's okay there, there, uh, I see where you're coming from now there is a much more obvious cohomology here given a differential graded algebra you have you have the you have the cohomology the Durant, what I call the Durant cohomology although some people don't like that so. that um, in in nice examples like something the torus things that are very close you'll recover the standard cohomology. But, and for graphs, you'll get something, but it's not usually. Uh, I don't know any good theorems about it, except in the case of a Cayley graph on a group. So in a Cayley graph on a group, so when the, when the arrows are generated by left translation along generators of the group, uh, then you you can um, you you can com you can compute this cohomology very explicitly, and you can show that for if the group is. Uh, um, Simple, something like that, then you get zero, as you would expect for a Lie group. Okay. You, but it's not something known. You get some, you get some very interesting cohomology, which you compute in some cases. Right. But, but I'm not aware of any good theorems. But that's a good, you know, it's I a really good. I was thinking about the Hausdorff cohomology of the path algebra, which. So yeah. it wouldn't. I, I honestly don't know the answer. Oh, okay. to that. Okay. I don't think I don't think you're going to get it, but you might do. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a more basic question? So, what are the conditions on the graph? Um, well, uh, for me, a graph is just anything with no self loops and uh, and no more than one arrow between between vertices. That's it. Um, uh, it's symmetric or something. Um, oh yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. I went through this too quickly, didn't I? So up to here, the, oops, up to here, there's no up to here, there's no restriction. But by the time you want a metric, if you're going to have a non-zero metric, then if you've got an x to y, you need to have a y to x. So from this point onwards, I sh um, th thank you for that. I should have mentioned that from this point onwards, in quantum Riemannian geometry, you will need the metric to be bidirect, the graph to be bidirected. So it's really just a graph, but then we add arrows in both directions. Okay. So thank you. Okay. So now I want to go to the question which um, will, which is of interest to people who come from Alan Kant school. So suppose that we have a star differential graded algebra. I don't just want to write down a spectral triple. I mean, Alan Kant's already done that, so it's no point doing that. I want to build one using quantum Riemannian geometry. So I want to have an actual spinner bundle. So I want to have a, a bimodule with a bimodule connection. So the axioms are very similar to what I wrote down before, but instead of being omega 1 here and omega 1 here, we just have s to s. But otherwise, you have the same issue. 
you have a, a left-handed Leibniz rule and you have a right-handed Leibniz rule expressed through a generalized braiding. But now the braiding is a colored braiding. It mixes S with another one like this. So if you just think about what I did before, it just generalizes immediately to an arbitrary bimodule. And um, then we want uh, some kind of map here, a bimodule map, which I call the Clifford action. But it has very minimal requirements. Any, any bimodule map here will allow you to compose Nadler S with the, with the Clifford action and get a map from S to S. So we get, a Dirac, we get something which is we get a candidate for a Dirac operator in a lot of generality, but we'll need conditions on this data to obey analyze axioms. Now, of course, we'll need charge conjugation, which is very important in, 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 um, in the geometry of the Dirac operator, it allows map J. And this should be an anti-linear, in our setting, it should be an anti-linear skew bimodule map. So this is the framework that Henry Banks and I introduced in this paper. Um, and it should be a, a, a skew bimodule map. That means if you multiply on the left, it comes out with a star on the right. That's a skew bimodule map. And, um, and it should square to plus or minus the identity. Sign is an unknown sign. Then the chirality, there should be a chirality operator, which should be a bimodule map which squares with the identity. And then there should be a sesquilinear inner product <laughs> allowing us to complete uh, the algebra A into a, or S rather, into a Hilbert space. And then we want the rest of our land axioms. So there are some commutation rules. So J should plus or minus commute with D. Gamma should plus or minus, it should anti-commute with gamma. Now, Alain makes a big deal about odd and even that are triples, but in fact, you could just impose this. And in, in our example, this will exist for all, all uh, patterns of signs. Uh, the, the period period of eight period, the pattern of signs forming a table of period eight that many of you will be familiar with. That's very that's really coming out of the classical limit when you look at ordinary spinners and bot periodicity. It's not really imposed on you from the geometry from the algebra. Um, so we, we regard gamma as, as, as possible in all in all uh, any pattern of signs. And then gamma should anti should plus or minus commute with j. With j. So there are some signs you plan from plan another prime. They do form a pattern, uh, and I uh, like them to form a certain pattern. The only thing I should tell you is that because our j is good, d is going to be anti commission uh, epsilon prime is minus the sign that Alan would use. Okay. Uh, there's a reason for that. It's in geometry, the natural operator is, is, is gamma mu d by, d by dx mu is actually anti commission um, Okay. So now there are other axiom quant axioms. Like these ones here, which are the scary contacts here. But these are all completely contained in, this, in, the, in the assumption that we had a bimodule and a bimodule setting. So, for example, you see this guy here is the action of this guy here is just the action from the other side. So, this just says that A acting from the left commutes with B star acting from the right, but that's just being a bimodule. So, yeah. How do you ensure that the, that the resolvent is compact? I think that's a. Yeah, well, okay. So. so yeah, so I am not, I don't know, because I'm not going to be doing that. I'm doing, I'm doing what I call sort of algebraic version uh, of Alan's axiom. So like a pre, what it should be honestly called a pre-spectral triple. So, um, and that's why, well, one reason why my examples will be finite dimensional. Uh, so anyway, you need some very nice geometrical properties on, um, on, on this data in order to obtain all of the, all of this layer. Well, all of these, all of this part of contacting. This, this is the part before you look at any analysis. And so, so this is what I call the local spectral triple uh, before you consider the Hilbert space. And so this is very, it's very natural. This, this is exactly like a star-preserving connection, but with J in the role of star. Do you remember what I told you? What it was on, on. Um, uh, so for omega one, it was that star commutes with dagger up to a flip, and the same thing here, but. J plays the role of star, but on, on, on S. And then this just says that, that gamma is, is covariant with respect to the Nabla S on the two sides. Um, covariantly constant. And the same thing for the Clifford action. This says that the Clifford action respects star in a natural way. And this says that it anti commutes with, with gamma. Now, you could also ask that the Clifford action is covariantly constant. And that is this, but that would require. That the, the, the tensor product connection on here commute on one side uh, intertwines with the connection on S, but that would require connection on, on omega one. So up to here, there's just any bimodule, 
and we can get the geometric part of quantum axioms, and we can add a Hilbert space and compute it and try to ensure our, our domains are correct, etc. Uh, but um, but there's actually another condition here, which is purely geometric. Now this would be true classically, because in classical geometry, the spinner connection is not some random connection. It's so it's, 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 it's associated to the frame bundle by the spinner representation, so it has the same root as the levi feeder connection, which is associated to a different representation of the frame bundle of, of, of O n. So, so the um, so so this expresses that because this is compatibility between the levi feeder connection or any connection you choose on omega one with the spinner connection, and so that so that's a very natural condition that we would like to add. Then there's another condition which is on the Clifford structure on the Clifford action, which is that you. And this is this is this is, doesn't really work very well, and I'm looking for a better way. But this is what we did in our paper. Um, we just suppose that this extent that this definition is well defined as a map from omega two. Now, uh, if you did that classically, classically omega two is is given is generated by omega one with anti-symmetric relations. So that would simply, if you think about that really hard, that will this will exactly say that the Clifford action by dx mu is exactly the Clifford algebra. So this is so this would reproduce the Clifford algebra uh, in in the classical limit. However, although it has the right limit, not everything that has the right limit is the right thing to do. So this is not doesn't work too well in examples. It's very nice on paper. Um, okay. So then um, okay. I want to we will discuss obviously a little bit about the structure when we come to it. I want to show you a construction. So I haven't got much time. Um, so this construction is something which is well known to people who, uh, in the right context. So if you have a classical orientable Riemannian manifold, there is something which I don't know what the right term is, but I call it the Hodge Dirac operator, and it's just a d plus delta as a map from omega one to omega m to omega m. This is the whole exterior algebra. So S is this guy. S is this guy. It's not spinners as we know it. So better triples have two different classical limits. There's the classical limit, which is the spinner bundle on the manifold. And there's the other limit, which is the Hodge Dirac operator, where S is actually the Curie algebra. And that does form a spectral triple uh, for any dimensional manifold. Uh, it doesn't fit Alan's table of signs. Um, the, so anyway, we will take, we'll, we'll construct an analog of this. But rather than working with the whole exterior algebra, we'll just work with, we'll just truncate it. So we'll look at the degree zero and degree one, omega a, a plus omega one. So that's what x is going to be, a plus omega one. And we'll look at a truncated version of, of, of Hodge Dirac operator. Now, we also want an extended trace. We'll, we'll want a trace. And there are two conditions that I will need. One I'm going to suppose them. I'm going to suppose the QRG, as I told you before, and two additional conditions. One is that the metric should be sigma symmetric, so it's not necessarily edge symmetric, but symmetric up to this generalized braiding sigma. And the other is that this being a trace is extended, and, and positivity and trace properties that you might want to suppose on A extends to one forms in the following way. Well, this is just positivity of, of on A, but it extends to one forms. If you think omega omega star evaluate with the metric with the in metric, that should always be positive. Similarly, this is the usual trace, and if you if you do it, uh, if you reverse the order here, you should also get the same. So this is what I call extended trace and extended positivity. And then there's one more condition, which is that remember that this guy was the divergence, right? Nabla D was the divergence. So you should want well, the integral of the delta of any one form here at DA should be zero. So that would be true for a closed manifold. So um, so we would like to have that condition. So now, with, so I'm just going to suppose with those conditions, then everything works. So the theorem is you take S to be A plus omega 1. You extend the connection. We're given the, the, the connection. It doesn't have to be leverage of It just has to be a connection on omega 1. But we can take the leverage of E if we want. Um, we extend it to a connection on the, on the direct sum. On this part, we just act with D. D lands you in omega 1, which we view as A tensor omega 1 over A. And here it just lands you in omega 1 tensor omega 1. So that lands in the right place. Sigma, uh, yes, it is a bimodule connection if, if lambda is, and sigma it, on 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 two form on a pair of two one forms it just looks like the original sigma, and between a and eta it's just multi multiplication. So it has a very simple form. Um, and the Clifford action again very simple. It's just multiplication uh, by omega, 
uh, or it's the metric, so it lands in A. So this lands again in omega 1 plus A, lands again in S. Um, if you were doing it over here, the Clifford Act structure here is, is, the, is the action of the Clifford algebra on the classical manifold by, by interior product and wedge product. Uh, was, uh, I think Costan was the first to observe that that forms the Clifford algebra, represents the Clifford algebra. So this is a piece of that. Then J uh, just acts the obvious way, each star, each bit of star. Gamma is, is, is part of the grading. This is a graded algebra and has minus one to the, to the degree. And this is the, how it looks at the on degree one will get a minus sign. The inner product for the, the pre Hilbert space structure is going to be just uh, the, the obvious one from, the, from this plus, plus this guy. This is why I needed these conditions. So then this will form a pre Hilbert space. Um, and uh, D, uh, from the construction I told you, would just be to apply the, the connection and then apply Clifford action. That would just come out to be like this. So this is D and this is delta. So this is D plus delta. Okay. So, that, so the theorem is that everything works with the algebra being non commutative. You get a fully, and, and if, if now there are based the Levitch Eta condition, if it's metric compatible, then this guy also holds. So you can see the quantum Ramonian geometry is compatible, fully compatible. It's double triple with, uh, with these guys. Okay. Then there's the issue about completion, uh, extending operators to the completion, etc., which I, I'm not going to be concerned about. I just have time to show you how it looks on graphs. So um, on the graph, because it's inner, I told you that and um, well, <laughs> there could be an alpha term, but if there are no triangles, there'll be no alpha term. But we, even if there are, we can just focus on the inner ones where alpha is zero. So if we focus on the inner connections, then uh, then nabla uh, omega will be omega will be theta tensor omega, which you can think about it is like this, plus the theta with the sum over all arrows. So that will just be on the front, minus uh, sigma of uh, of um, Omega tensor theta, and so that's so there's some some sigma operator which is given by some coefficients which I've written like this, and I'm going to regard these for every x and y or the x and w. I'm going to have a matrix here which is a which is a matrix of this size, and this matrix should be invertible and it should be that it's uh, kind of not, I wouldn't say it's unitary but it's a bit it's about this relation here, and um, and then. The requirement of being sigma symmetric is that if you apply sigma on the metric coefficient on the metric, you should get you know it should be compatible. You should get back the metric. So that's you know without going into details, you can plausibly believe that sigma symmetry gives you there. Okay. Now you stick in the framework. So d of a function is just to apply d the differential. The finite difference across a delta function is just the sum of arrows that go in minus the sum of arrows that go out from the given x. And D of an arrow, because S is two parts, it has functions and arrows. So this is a basis of functions, this is a basis of arrows, uh, basis of omega 1. Um, the function uh, D on an arrow is just to bring out the metric minus the function, minus this thing, this combination of S. And this combination is just this, it's a, it's a, if you regard this as a matrix, this is the column sum uh, for, of, the, of the sigma xx. Um, column sum with the remaining y as a variable. So that's what goes in here. Uh, gamma, J and gamma look like this. Now, so this, according to what I told you, this gives you all the geometric data on the triple. Now there's one obvious choice. Yeah, you can just take sigma x, y to be the identity. So, and that's because on any, on any, bi, on any, on any inner calculus, sigma is a bimodule map. What's the simplest bi module map from omega 1 tensor omega 1 to itself? The identity map. So you could, so for any inner calculus, you've always got a canonical choice of connection, which is the, if you, if you don't care about other geometric properties, which is the, which is the canonical inner connection given by sigma as the identity. So that's a canonical choice. Now, for the Hilbert space structure, I haven't explored it too much. I've just taken the simplest counting measure. You could put in more weights and play around with it. If you, if you just take the counting measure here, then this is what the then this is what the ex extension to one forms looks like, and I want that to be positive. So that means you want the lambda x y to be negative. So it's slightly there are. Although I said all the h i's in my previous talk were positive, in fact, if you if you for this construction it will be negative, but only the ratios enter anyway. Um, uh, in terms of the coefficients of eta, you write the coefficients of eta. 
like this. So now, um, and then the requirement of being divergence compatible, um, that turns out to be this. So that says that the that it can't be edge symmetric if S X Y is not one. However, the canonical case X X Y is one is fine if it's edge symmetric. So the so one thing you can certainly say is if the metric is edge symmetric, then you can just take the canonical choice and then you will always have a connection. But it turns out that whatever the connection is, here the operator doesn't see a lot of the connection. It only sees S X Y. And even that gets washed out because by the time I impose this condition and I stick that into here, I've just got this. We don't even see the connection. The deck operator only depends on the metric coefficients. It's lost all the information about the choice of connection, provided the connection exists and obeys some conditions. So that's why you get something completely canonical, which I believe was first studied by E.B. Davis, but I'm not completely sure of the history, but that's what I understood. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I just want to very quickly say that there are lots of other examples. You can apply to the 2 by 2 matrices. Um, you can, uh, so two by two matrices, they have a natural exterior algebra generated by a central basis S and T. But the weird thing is they commute, they don't anti commute. And then there's an inner calculus, so there's a theta, which is this guy. What that means is that the differential is continued with theta, so it looks like it has a partial derivative in the S direction and in the T direction, and they are just given by commutator with these guys. This is the elementary matrix with one, with, with one in one two place. The metric I'm going to take is like this, and then this has a one. This has actually quite. It has actually a four parameter. I think modulo QRP, but you just focus on the one parameter family, which is like this. And now, if I write um, phi to be in, in this basis, the basis of A is one and F and T. That's the basis of S. So I can write this as a three as a three vector with coefficients in two by two matrices. Then the Clifford action just looks like actric by this matrix. And the Dirac operator looks like this. So this is a bit like the usual Dirac operator. These are the partial derivatives given like this, and these are the these are play the role of the gamma matrices. And this is J, this is gamma. Um, the Hilbert space structure is given by taking the trace. Um, it obeys the extended trace co conditions as long as this lambda is negative. Um, and the um, you, now there are many other solutions of this. So this is just the canonical construction I told you today. You can also go by hand and just solve for any quantum running geometry, find all possible spinner bundles, uh, and then you'll get one. This, for example, this one is a three dimensional spinner, it's a three spinner, which is a bit weird. But you can find two spinners. This is in this paper with uh, Evelyn Hero Torres. Um, you can also do it on the body sphere and the nonlinear of torus. So, this is these papers. So, um, I'll just end here since I've run out of time. Um, so, you can so. If you've accepted the formalism of quantum winding geometry, there are a lot of things you can do already. You can already go away and do them. So this is addressed to younger people in the audience, perhaps. <coughs> you like calculating things with Mathematica. You can solve for the moduli of QRGs on your favorite star algebra. And you'll, you, whenever we've done that, you, you find a very rich moduli. Um, then you can explore quantum gravity by integrating over, the, over that moduli. So there are, even in the known models and, and in the new models, there's a lot of physics to be explored. We're coming from mathematical physics. And then if you're coming from analysis, which most of you are, I guess, um, it's a very interesting question, how do you extend this to operator algebras? Because the, the hard part is the tensor product over A. And you do not want to write a tensor product over A in the interdimensional case. So you, but there are surely ways to work around that. and uh, and. Uh, of course, you can get. You can, that's the beauty of Alain's better triples is that you know he goes straight to the operator algebra picture. But to my mind, you want to have more infrastructure. You want to know what is the metric, what is the connection underlying the better triple, and not every better triple arises by that construction. So that's very important. So I think that's a really good challenge I'm throwing out there for the operator algebraists in the room. Then, uh, even within the formalism of QRG, there are some loose ends. One is the most important, which is an Einstein tensor. And we would like to have new ideas. And I just mentioned that one new idea comes looking at geodesics. It turns out that when you formulate quantum geodesics on a non-commutative space, you can do it. Instead of looking at points moving on the manifold, you look at the functions flowing on the manifold, like a wave function flowing, evolving. And, um, and, uh, and this is an example from this paper. This is an example of a quantum geodesic on two by two matrices. There are four entries which are evolving in time. These are the four colors here. 
Um, so that's an example of a quantum geodesic. Uh, you can also do quantum geodesics on the Heisenberg algebra, and you recover, you recover quantum mechanics if you want. Okay. That's a quantum geodesic flow. Um, you can also do it on the Minkowski space or high pressure of Minkowski space. Uh, but the thing about this formalism is, is that if you take the classical limit of a quantum geodesic, you can discover, you discover very naturally, if you look at, the, at what's called the convective derivative of the divergence of the velocity vector field, um, you'll discover that it's actually a contraction of the Vichy Tbilisi tensor with evaluated on, the, on that vector field. So, uh, so really what arises there is the Vichy as a quadratic form on the space of vector fields. And so that's a possible angle to the non-commutative case. And then the other thing, the other uh, we also think we'd like to do in physics is Lagrangian field theory. And here this also com this is completely mysterious because on the non-commutative manifold we don't know how to get started with variational calculus in a rigorous way. But, but so the approach to that, if you want to follow physics, uh, um, sorry, mathematical physics, is you should use a jet bundle. And so there is a there is a definition of quantum jet bundle in my paper with Francisco Simao, which is here, and um, in this paper. And uh, so that we have, we don't we have one thing connected to the Lagrangian field theory yet, but in the fullness of time. Um, and then of course you can go back to this comparison between quantum Ryan geometry spectral triples and and con spectral triples. For example, how does the geodesic distance between states in con's picture compare with the geodesic distance defined maybe on a graph, as going along a graph along a path or something like that? Um, so there's a lot of inter a lot of play around comparing these two approaches and how they relate to each other. I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any questions? So uh, you mentioned here the graph of the A series. So for the B C and D series, like is it known or have it been well? The pre, the pre projective algebra is very well, very well studied and known. People haven't looked at this quotient forming series algebra. So, far as I know, they haven't been looked at. Mm -hmm. So, it, it already took us like months to, you know, to, <laughs> to find, to compute this table was mathematical running for a very long time over several weeks. Mm -hmm. And then to stare at the table and see what was going on was, was also a lot of work. Yeah. So, so, it's a very nice problem, and I'm sure there's a beautiful mathematical theory behind it, which will eventually be discovered <coughs> in the representation theory. The challenge and, uh, yeah. and uh, so is the A series is simply less. So for the non simply less, do you believe that there are some extra conditions that have to be imposed on the metric, or it will be realized for you from yeah. your um, file? Like yeah, I mean, you what, what happens if you? I mean, the most naive thing to do would be to think of um, a quiver rather than a graph, mm -hmm. and then and then you would and then you and then you and that's fine. This theorem here works just as well with quivers. But what happens is, is that if you take this definition where you take all the arrows, then it's not you, the, subj the subjectivity condition fails. So the, this this axiom here fails. Oh. So so uh, so I have written a paper on that with one of my students, Tao uh, Wenjing Tao. Um, you can so you can so you can still do a lot of quantum line geometry, but you have to be aware that not every one form will be generated by by differentials. So then it's just more work. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, but that's certainly doable. That's fun. Um, you mentioned in passing by that uh, for set things work uh, kind of smoothly and symmetrically. Mm -hmm. So, so it seems like in that infinite dimension case things work. Things work, and it makes me wonder, like uh, for other groups uh, with the length Dirac uh, oh. operator, can you get some models in your formalism? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the limitation here is really a matter of. Having enough time, or having enough graduate sure, students, yeah. or have, you know, or, or having enough computer power, uh, all three, in fact, uh, you need all three of those. So, so the um, yeah. So what I can say is, is that for things like a finite group like S three, you could there's a very natural metric you can, you can compute uh, a lot of things, but for infinite uh, infinite groups, um, yeah. I mean, the, the hardest part is what should be the so. I mean, you have to choose. You have to choose. So the thing that has a geometry, yeah. Uh, for a, in a group case, what happens is that um, there's a very natural basis for omega one of less invariant. In the group case, you have less invariant one forms, mm -hmm. and they form a basis over the algebra. So, so the out of this module omega one becomes a free module. Yeah. Omega one becomes uh, instead of being a projective module, it becomes a free module. 
And, um, and there's something that, and the nicest case is bicovariant calculus. So that means that the, the set of generators should be ad invariant, ad stable. So a conjugacy class or a sum of conjugacy classes. But that plays a role like a Lie algebra. And that's the case which has been studied. You can compute the non commutator Durand cohomology, et cetera. It behaves very much like a Lie algebra. It's like a kind of finite Lie theory, which applies to a finite group or to any discrete group, let's say discrete Lie theory. So that, so on the algebraic side, that works very well. The geometric side has at least something too much apart from this one theorem about the Durand cohomology. So computing the metric, etc. Um, you it, because it's a basis. You would choose. You would if you do it in a basis of basis of one forms, basis of less invariant one forms. Then it's much easier. The data becomes a tensor, with, labeled by the indices of the, of the basis. So everything becomes very amenable, but still very hard to compute. So there's very little results so far. But I think it's a good problem. And um, the yeah, let's leave it at that.